The first thing is to thank Jim and Steve for bringing us all together this week. It's a fantastic, um, fantastic concentrated week, and I hope you find it both informative and inspiring. Um, I'm also especially happy to be invited to discuss the work on identity and inequality. Um, it's a work that challenges some of basic presumptions of economic models, but also has a long history here at the University of Chicago, which I'll point out to you. So it's particularly gratifying to be here for that. Um, the third preamble is that I'm also happy to be here because I didn't think I would be here a week ago when I found out that I severely sprained my ankle but did not break it. So I'm here, um, but I'm not going to be my normal active self running across the room and I may actually have to sit down at some point. So you'll excuse that. Everything is now in the slides rather than multimedia, which is my normal technique when I lecture. But um, we'll, I, you know, I hope we'll be able to still have a very good experience together. Okay, so I'm going to be lecturing on identity and inequality, and as you'll see as we go along, I'm going to be giving some background material, but towards the, as we move along the lectures, I'll be also moving along in time in the research. And so I'll be ending with current research and future research directions, which I very much hope you or um, your colleagues pick up. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now this is really crude, and my apologies to all of you people in the room who spend so much time measuring inequality, but what's inequality all about? Some people have more, and some people have less. So what? So I'm going to again to say, why do we care? Why should we care about inequality? Well, and a basic point is, well, we're social scientists. Okay, so we're social scientists, we study inequality. Maybe we just want to describe such patterns, and we want to understand why they emerge. But why do we concentrate on inequality per se as a pattern of interest? I mean, there's many, many social phenomena out there. Why do we care about inequality? So just to summarize some of the things that were said this morning, maybe inequality is bad for growth. You know, maybe we, we care about inequality because somehow it's important for growth or development or the production of people like von Neumann. Uh, and so, or maybe it's good, as we may have heard. I don't know. But in somehow we think inequality may be an ingredient for some larger objective, like growth. But maybe inequality we think of it as being unfair, or it's unjust somehow that some people have more and some people have less. And we may think it's particularly unjust when these inequalities are systematic. Certain social groups have more, and certain social groups have less. So it's not as if this inequality is randomly distributed in the population. There are patterns to it which relate to social groups. Um, for example, I mean, I'm just going to give the typical examples. In the United States, we talk a lot about African Americans and Hispanics. I've spent the last year in France, where the discussion is all about Africans and North Africans. And I want to point out that in many parts of the world, it's women. Women are disadvantaged. Women get less. And we somehow think that that's unjust. Yes? I have a question about the unjust aspect. Like, oftentimes, if you hear an economist say, you know, we're um, positivists, we're not limited. So, like, how, yeah. I guess, like, with the equality of research, like, how do we, okay. how do we kind of, like, discuss um, well, the questions so of unfairness to, like, other economists, like, who will see themselves more as, like, positive? Okay, so I have two responses to that. One is to just use the typical thing that you'll, that you'll see in any economics textbook, textbook which says there's a positive approach and a normative approach. You could say you want to describe things or you want to change things, okay? But I have a deeper criticism, which is that even the positive approach itself is, in, by its essence, normative. The fact that I think inequality is important to study. But that itself is making a statement, okay? So in some sense, we are engaged in a normative exercise, even if we're only describing patterns. Okay? And I think we should embrace that. We should state that honestly. Then we can have debates. And we heard some of the debates earlier about what is a just society. We can have those discussions as well. I can just ask a kind of follow-up question on that. Like, <clears throat> so we're all here, we're going to be studying these issues. Should like, a takeaway from this experience be that um, we have these really specific study inequality and like this 
scholarly interest, or should we just stick to ourselves and make sure we compartmentalize in terms of saying? Boy, that's a tough one, and I guess every individual will have to answer it, I think, for themselves. I think my view is that it's, um, we're engaged in this, um, we're engaged in this, um, in this venture for a reason. Some of them come from personal reasons, some of them from more intellectual reasons. And, but I do think what's critical, something that Jim said earlier, what we say and what we do and what we study and what we publish matters. Okay? It matters to policy, it matters if these ideas get out there. And so we do have to do our work carefully, and we do have to do our work well, and we have to do it in a principled way. OK. OK, so, um, so notice what we've just done. So I said inequality, it matters. There are these patterns. It's not necessarily randomly distributed. We've started talking about people in social terms. We've started using social categories. So we've started using what we're going to basically call, what, what George and I have been calling identity, and other people call that identity. At a minimum, identity is a designator of a social group. And what we want to discuss today is how does identity figure into inequality? Is it a mere descriptor? So I say, oh, you know, there's some people that I'm going to call African Americans, and they, here's their pattern. Or is identity, is this going to work, my little, oh, there we go. Is identity part of a process, right? Is it part of the process that creates and sustains inequality? So what I want to do first is think about why we should, well, discuss why we should think about identity inequality. I'd like to give you a general overview of theoretical approaches. And I want to introduce to you identity economic, which is the work that George and I have been engaged in as a new approach. So the economic theories are going to think of identity inequality as an equilibrium phenomenon and inequality and preferences based on social identity. And in the second part of the talk, I'd like to talk about identity and inequality experiments. There is quite a lot of to do out, out there in economic theory and in economic empirical work and in experiments about people having preferences for fairness or people having preferences for inequality or actually this should be inequity aversion. Those are the words you see about out there. And I'd like to propose that actually people may have preferences for inequality. And I'm going to show you some experimental results that show you that. And it's important that these preferences for inequality emerge when people are divided into groups, when there are social groups involved. Okay? So you take a bunch of homogeneous people in the lab and you have them play games with each other and they're going to act fair on average. I'll show you some of that. But when we divide people into groups, People are actually not going to, and all people do not act fairly. Okay? And in fact, they seem to pay to make the situation unequal as long as they come out on top. So I think we want to think deeply about do people, how do people understand inequality? Do people like, some people like unequal situations as long as they're on top? Okay. All right, so that's the outline of today's lectures. Okay, so we're going to launch right now into the economic theory. Okay, and what I'm going to do here is give you a sense of the different approaches theorists have taken for understanding the influence of social groups or social norms <coughs> on behavior where inequality is one outcome. <coughs> okay, so why should, as a theorist, I be concerned about this? Well, putting identity or social category markers is rather standard practice in empirical studies of socioeconomic outcomes. So you read any, pretty much any labor economics paper or public, fi public finance paper, and there's going to be a dummy variable for black, female, ethnicity, maybe region, maybe state. We've all, we've all heard about Louisiana and Mississippi. Well, now I live in North Carolina. I, okay, I teach at Duke. And so these things have a lot more salience now, you know, when people talk about the southern states. Um, but I could tell you some things about my experience in North Carolina. So we put in, we put in, we put in these dummies, right? right? And we think they're capturing something. Right? We also put in interaction effects, right? To think that there's something about the, whatever these variables are of interest. We think that something's different, perhaps, about black and women and the way, um, and the way that may be determining, um, uh, for example, uh, the, the effect of a particular policy. So to fix ideas, what I'm going to do, have this one example kind of running through the talk, and of course it builds on 
some of the things that, was ha that we were t discussing this morning about labor market and how the labor market is so important to um, inequality. Um, consider a child or more precisely, um, or actually a child or an adolescent. And I actually think it's important that we're thinking of children and adolescents. These are not adults who are making these decisions, right? We're thinking of a child or an adolescent who underachieves in school. It does not that get the education that would be predicted by the costs and benefits of this education. So two examples would say be African American children in the United States and girls in a developing country. Okay? So we're going to run that through um, the talk. What can account for the dummy variables that we might stick in a regression that's looking at African Americans and education achievement or the interaction effect? So what the theorist, what a theorist does is try to unpack the black box of what might be behind, what might be behind that dummy variable. What's going on behind that dummy variable that's significant in our regressions? Okay, what's the mechanism? So that's why we should be studying identity and inequality. We put in our regressions. We know it's important. The question is, what are the mechanisms? And if we begin to understand the mechanisms, of course, we can start to test for which mechanisms may be correct. And then we may also might be get a sense of, well, how can we address these problems? If we can get, again, back to this normative positive thing, if we think it is indeed a, pos a problem. So now what I'd like to do is give a general overview of the theoretical approaches. So first, let's just go over a basic economic model. So these are the basic economic models we know and love. Okay? You start out with an individual, and this individual has utility from his own choices and her own actions. She, her utility depends on her own idiosyncratic preferences. right? So this person likes apples or likes oranges or likes bananas. These preferences are exogenous. right? They don't come from anything within the, the context of the model. And this person makes decisions given the technology that's available okay? or the constraints that she faces. And these choices lead to particular patterns of behavior. So this is the absolute standard model that everybody learns in first year micro, right? You all learned this, right? Okay, you're all nodding. Maskell, beginning, I learned it from Varian. Okay, standard stuff. The next thing you learn is games, right? You learn game theory. And game theory here is including models of asymmetric information, signaling, adverse selection, and so on. We now move to strategic interaction. Now, individuals have payoffs, okay? So it's the same thing as utility, but we now call them payoffs. Individuals have payoffs from own and others' actions, right? So it's not only their own actions that matter, but other people's actions that matter, okay? Uh, people have idiosyncratic costs and benefits from their own and others' actions. Again, these idiosyncratic costs and benefits are exogenous. They're just an individual is born with them, so to speak. The game form, uh, we can think of those as the institution. So we impose on this structure who moves first, who moves second, who knows what, when, whether it's a competitive market, an oligopoly, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, so we put a game form, or a set of institutions, on top of these individuals, and we look for equilibria, and these equilibria can get very complicated in cases of complete information, imperfect information, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then the equilibria here are going to give us patterns, right? And those patterns are supposed to be something that matches some observable pattern um, out there, OK? And I'm going to give you examples of, of patterns of inequality when we get you to specific examples, OK? Moving right along, here's a bit of both the old world and the new world. Um, we might actually want to know about these preferences. These preferences that are giving us the utilities from own actions and the payoffs from own actions and other actions. Let's actually think about those preferences. So is it just that people like apples and some people like oranges? Is it just that? You know, some people like apples and some people like oranges? Or is there something perhaps more systematic about preferences? So again, here's a bit of the, um, our, our debt to Gary Becker. Gary Becker uh, wrote down models where people had preferences over what might think of non-economic variables, right? People would say have preferences for children, right? 
And now we talk about that without even remembering that that was new at one point. Okay? People have preferences over who they work with and who they don't work with. Some people might not like working with African Americans, or some people just might not like a female colleague. So there are these likes and dislikes that you might want to think about, right? that are in people's preferences. So it's like, apple, like apples and oranges, some people might like working with some people and not working with other people. What George and I do is we think about these likes and these dislikes, right? And we think about these likes and dislikes, but not just as being idiosyncratic. It's not just that people are born disliking and liking certain things but they may form those likes and dislikes through their upbringing or through their social environment. So it's not a coincidence that people from certain regions of the country at certain historical periods did not like working with African Americans or African Americans being in certain positions. Of course, we weren't, they weren't even called African Americans at that time, right? Okay, or that people in certain, it's actually interesting. So in the military, we all know that the military has changed its policy towards homosexuals, and there was this big survey of military personnel and how they felt about working with homosexuals, and there were regional differences, right? That's not an accident, and I bet you can predict, I bet you can predict just now, for those of you who know the United States well, how those preferences laid out. If we give you a map of the country, you would do a good job predicting, right? You're all nodding, okay? So the point is, is that these, li oops, these likes and dislikes are not necessarily randomly distributed. They're not necessarily idiosyncratic. They're coming from the social context. That's point number one about identity and preferences. Point number two is that these preferences are not only about liking and not liking something. They're about should doing things and shouldn't doing some things. They're norms about how people should behave. What is considered to be appropriate and inappropriate behavior. So again, I, this, what I was just talking about with this um, homosexuality discussion, you know, is it okay? You know, is it okay or not? Uh, and so what people, what people think is okay to do or not okay to do, again, is coming from the social context. And those can influence people's choices. So what we want to do is expand the notion of preferences, expand the notion of preference to include identity and norms. So what is appropriate for certain people may not be appropriate for other people. Okay, and I'll give you examples. Now we take this and we combine it with technology and constraints, just like we might do in a basic model. And we combine it with strategic interaction, like we might do in a game. And we're going to have choices and equilibria, which give patterns of behavior. Okay. And we're going to think that these patterns of behavior may match and help us understand certain patterns of interest. So I'm going to give you examples of all these models, but I wanted to run down here sort of a, an outline of how, how we as economic theorists sort of build our models and, and, and to think about these models um, systematically. Okay. All right, so let me give you a little bit more meat on this. So what I want to do now, that I've got uh, up top, I'm describing the basic economic model. Okay, so now I'm going to just talk us through what we something very, very simple on um, a child making a decision about how much schooling to get. So this child has a utility function. This utility function um, comes along with exogenous or idios and idiosyncratic preferences, and this child is making a choice given technology and constraint. So for example, the child likes school. Okay, that would be something about her preferences. The child weighs the costs and benefits of schooling given the school quality and the opportunity cost of attending school and possible job networks. Right? So this child decides how much to invest in education. And from that, we can get a pattern that blacks have lower levels of academic achievement because they attend worse schools and they have worse job networks. Okay? Right? We can easily obtain that from such a simple model. We could get the pattern that girls have lower levels of academic achievement because they have a high op higher opportunity to cost of time because they have to do household work. Right? So you can see that in developing countries a lot. The girls have to drop out of school when they're young. The, the brothers continue, but they don't. Now this is useful. It's a useful model to have because indeed there may be such technology and such constraints. It may be, and it is true, that. African Americans in general attend schools that are not as well equipped as white Americans, right? 
But this begs the question why blacks actually attend worse schools, right? Why are the schools worse? And also begs the question why girls must attend to household chores. You know, why, is, why, do we, why is that the case? So these constraints are there, they may be there, but these models don't tell us how these constraints emerge and where they come from. It's a way of yeah. It's it's and it's a way of endogenizing the constraints. It's a one way of thinking about it. So people think about it whether it's in the preferences or in the constraints. So actually, here I was trying to give two examples. The worst schools was something about the technology, and the 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 attending to household chores was something in the constraints. Well, that's, that's interesting. So I, I guess so then like the, the criticism. I guess it's like our constraints really constraints. Yes, well, the constraints come, may come from somewhere. The constraints themselves may be produced by the economic system or by the social system that creates the constraints. Yeah. So, so in the sense that you can get people to kind of like, if these constraints are like, the sense like hard constraints like that wall is that these are more kind of like flexible. Why is the wall there? No, I'm serious. I'm, I'm serious about that because we constructed, we constructed our room in this way that I'm in front of you, you're listening to me. Yes, so, it, so I, I obviously I'm pushing the boundaries of, of what I mean, but the, the, that a child faces certain constraints. Why are those constraints? Why those constraints? Why are the constraints, for, for example, tighter? For an African American child than for a white top child. Yeah, I like this. It's kind of this is like a follow up to the conversation we were having with where um, you know, blacks from other countries come to the United States and they see lots of opportunities. Um, and, you know, whereas, you know, like, a native born black will see those same opportunities, but their response to it may be different, and in part because of like, how they interpret that. Constraint. It could be but also not, how they, right. Yeah, I see. Okay. So, the, so now let's go to strategic interaction. So an overview here so, is... Um, just to clarify the question, would you want to include, sort of go back just one slide, you just for a second, just to clarify. Would you want to include things like, you know, traditional explanations, so let's get a male-female explanation that's been given around here a lot, it's basically comparative advantage, <coughs> right? And biological factors, comparative advantage, some small differences that might lead to the patterns of specialization. I don't know if you well, so here's, here's my take on that. So yes, I know women bear children. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I'm very well aware of that. But the, how, but how, but the constraints of that, by, that, that, the constraints that that biology places on, an, on, on a woman, right, can be very different in a different time and different places, how we understand that. Okay, so we can substitute for women's labor, for example, not women's delivery labor, but for women's labor, uh, bringing up children, we can substitute for that by, by hiring labor. So yeah, I was just thinking something like the social, I mean, the biological and social factors that you do have, like oxytocin production. You know. Sure. There is a whole pattern where you know, there is a biological basis for the bonding between mother and child, the attachment, and then the value that might be put. So the question is whether or not what looks like a constraint might also be a choice in that setting that might actually be a source of utility. Or sort of sure, but then that would be, so, oh boy, now I'm getting, so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted to clarify what a constraint So, So in some sense there, I, I guess, uh, that, you know, do I think that, I guess the, the question is, do I think that there is some real hard constraint out there that would, ha that for example, would have to do with gender and, and, you know, that a woman has a certain biology which is different than a man's which involves reproduction? Right. Yes, I'm not going to say that that's not there as a constraint. The question is: Is to what extent is that to what extent is that constraint um, here? I can say mitigated by how the society deals with reproduction. Okay, and I'm so. I'm just so thinking that a woman would have another choice than a man does. I mean, that's that's kind of putting a slightly different spin. But if you would say there's an additional element of the choice that you can either produce goods or produce children. And Sometimes they're in competition because of some fixed cost and so forth. Sure. Yeah. So then if there's some advantage to specializing in one activity or the other, you could get a story that would, it would come from thinking. Yes, so, thinking but, so but here's, but very good. Sure, so we can go back and forth on this. The, the, the question is, is what are the advantages to specializing? But why don't we, why don't, so the thing is, is uh, here's, here's what, I, what I, I'll just make one point on this, is that the extent to which the biological constraints or characteristics or you know, features are there 
has led to different outcomes at different points in time and also across societies. So that's the point, right? So the fact of how we understand the biology and how the biology has its econo plays out in these economic choices is shaped also by the norms, right, that govern, say, motherhood and the other facilities that may be available. And those norms and those other facilities are, are produced within an economic context and, and ec through economic interactions. Yes? Just quickly on what you were saying, I mean, in the societies that she's talking about, women absolutely do not have a choice to produce goods and be paid, you know, on the labor market at, in the same way that men do. And that's the point of the fact that their education is limited from a very early age, then it's not that they reach childbearing and they've had all of the same opportunities and now they have a choice how to take this path or this path, right? No, it's no, that I appreciate that. I'm just thinking that sort of, we think like in the U.S. But she's not talking about the U.S. when she says girls must attend household chores instead of going to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the girl in the developing country. Girl in the developing country, where there might be discrimination or some kind of... No, I, I'm not denying any of that. I'm just no. trying to get a sense of where yeah, so, so, okay. the constraints are. Yeah. So I'm not okay. taking a position. I'm just trying okay. to interpret exactly what's a constraint and what's a preference. Okay. Why don't, why don't I keep going? Because I think this is, this is a discussion that um, is... Uh, could, could go on for many hours, interestingly, for many hours. Um, all right, so, so now suppose we had, you know, this is the second basic kind of model. We've got the strategic interaction model. So we have individuals' payoffs depend on own and others' actions, and the equilibria are giving us a social pattern. And so we can think of these kinds of games in two forms. There can be a repeated game uh, where people punish those who violate the equilibrium action. And so there's an equilibrium that emerges that can be a bad social norm. And so this is the sort of typical way economists have modeled social norms is the equilibrium of a repeated game. Another kind of strategic interaction we can see is a signaling game where people's actions indicate some underlying unobserved attribute and the equilibrium is a social norm. So the fact that people are taking a certain action as a signal, people label that social norm. Okay, so, what are, so again in our, our example here, Okay, so um, girls don't attend school because if they attend school, they won't be able to get married. And why can't they get married? Because anyone who marries an educated girl will be shunned and so on. Okay, this is the t way these models work. Um, and this is a model I'm going to show you later. Um, blacks don't achieve in school because it reveals that they're dedicated to providing public goods to their community. So not going to a school is a signal that you're dedicated to your community. And so then here's the point, is that these models don't have any content per se uh, about you know, who these social groups are. You just add labels to them, and then you have a theory about these interactions, right? Being women, having to do with blacks, or having to do with females. OK, that's what I just said. Do we think about like, the norms being determined at the same time as the actions, or are the norms kind of the outcome of the actions? Both. And I'll get to that later. Both. But then what happens if there are multiple equilibria, then we choose one way. I can't hear you. What happens if there are multiple equilibria, and then we we'll end up with big where women don't, uh, don't go to school, but there is another equilibrium where you know, women go to school. And oh, yeah. Go. In most of these models, there's multiple equilibria, and then there's a bad one. And I'll, I'll show you that. Okay, we can answer that later. Now, so um, I think that these, um, these, this, this way of understanding social norms as equilibria or potentially bad equilibria is useful because then collective effort may be needed to change them. So one example that I can think of which is really um, quite striking is this phenomenon or practice of female genital mutilation and we know that in many communities in Africa, it's very, very difficult to eradicate this process because, again, people think that their daughter won't be able to get married if they don't subject their daughter to this operation. And what has changed this in some countries is putting a penalty. It's a public policy intervention in putting a penalty on this operation. Um, okay. Oh, and sorry. Um, the other point I want to make is 
we're going to see that the theoretical requirements to sustain these equilibria are also very strong. So on theoretical grounds, they can be shaky. But I think a more important point is that when we look out there at these norms, right, so something like female genital mutilation, homosexuality, African American um, acting white, what women are supposed to do or not, the women in math, you know, you name it, there's enormous amount of discussion about it in the literature, in the press, in the law, okay? So the law, by the way, is very clear on what it thinks is a constraint, right? It's very clear that it says, you know, when it comes to job discrimination, the only thing that's allowed is something that's biological. And the, and the Supreme Court actually mentions sperm donor as a job that a woman might not be able to do. Okay, there are, no, it's, in the, it's in the law, it's in the, it's in the Supreme Court decision. Um, there are activists who are out there trying to change the way we understand norms and so on. So that we, I think that we as social scientists should not also ignore that there is so much, con, there's so much discussion and debate about what is appropriate and inappropriate behavior. And to ignore that and say, oh, you know, preferences are just idiosyncratic, we're born with them, we, I like apples, you like oranges, and we can all live, that's not, the, that's not what's going on out there. There's huge discussions about what's appropriate and what's inappropriate behavior within communities and across societies. Okay. Can I ask something? Yeah. Yes. So, so going to the repeated game framework, does, going to the repeated game framework, doesn't that like undermine the the project because uh, you do not need to assume any identity component, any... Sure, so you're going to have a problem. We're going to have a problem that when you observe an, when you observe, um, an outcome, there may be several theories which can explain the same outcome. So then you have a problem of figuring out which theory is the better explanation, right? It's, there's no difference between my identity model and other possible um, competition among models, right? I'm adding a competitor. So then what we want to do is figure out very clever empirical methods, right, to distinguish among these different expl explanations. It's a and different uh, route of explaining something. I mean, saying uh, bad equilibrium is uh, kind of explaining things with, without addressing identity or formation of preferences and stuff like that, right? I mean, I mean, for example, these fathers do not want to do it to, to their I daughters. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. That's going to have to So speak up. the fathers in those countries uh, do not uh, want to go through the process of uh, <laughs> hurting their daughters, but they still do that because of some like uh, right. bad equilibrium that's going on. Right. But it's not that their preferences are such that... Uh, How do we know that? To me, you know, you can go out there and you can interview people. You can interview people, and they're going to tell you that you, know, you will go and interview people, so uh, I actually don't have, they're not actually in this list, uh, activists. You can go there, you can interview people, and they will tell you what they think about it. And they will tell you, no, this is a good thing. It's purification, okay? okay? So now that's not, you know, what you want is actually data on that. And that's going to be harder to get. So uh, last one, and then I'm gonna move on. Uh, just that, like interviewing people, like, I, I, I... I mentioned a very specific example, like uh, a friend of mine recently did a study in Zambia, like if you interview, you interview men about contraception, they're going to tell you that it's bad. Then if you investigate a little more, you're going to find out that they think that this is somehow related with the overall fertility, like this reduced fertility overall. Yeah. So there is actually a preference for having kids, and this gets by yeah. uh, lack of information transmitted into, sure. into like uh, aversion right. and contraception. So it's, it's very hard, like the way you, you, yeah. you ask the question, you might, you might basically get the answer you want or the one you don't want. Absolutely. Then we have to build better surveys. So the point is, is just because we can't measure it well now doesn't mean that it's something that we should ignore and not consider and not study. Okay, so um, preferences may also be, so this is the third category of models, preferences may also be a possible source of inequality. Um, so Becker, of course, um, had a taste-based theory of discrimination. In the same way, some people like apples and others like oranges, some people may not want to work with blacks or women. Employers might not want to then hire this group because worker with these tastes would require a, a wage premium, right? So if you hire somebody and they have to work with a black co-worker, you have to pay them more. 
Um, and so since people, since they don't, workers, employers don't want to have to pay this wage premium, well, they're not going to hire blacks and women. And so then blacks and women will have lower benefits of education. Okay? But of course, we know that competition, if firms are perfectly competitive, we could eliminate such high cost firms. Okay? So it's a very nice theory. And I think the point I'd like to make is, well, it would be wonderful if everything, was all, if everything and the world were perfectly competitive, but it's not. And the point that I think we should take away from this model is that preferences may matter, and they may matter to what people are paid and what employers will have to pay people. And again, what we do in the model is we introduce, we have these likes and these shoulds, and the preferences are not idiosyncratic, they're socially derived, and they depend on people's identity. So let me give you a little bit of a deeper sense of what we mean by identity. We're going to be getting deeper and deeper as we go through the talk. So what is identity? What are we trying to do here? Identity is a person's sense of self, their self-image. It's how a person views him or herself or how others view him or her. And so identity could just be simply used as, as a descriptor. I am Hispanic. I am a woman. Identity could also be used as a way of discussing feelings or emotions. I have a strong sense of identity. I feel good about myself. And this judgment depends on the ideals or the norms that a person holds for him or herself and others hold for that person. So it depends on the norms for being Hispanic, for being black, for being women. So whether I feel good about myself okay, will depend on whether I'm upholding or not the norms for women in my society. Okay, that's what I just said. Okay. Okay, so what we do is we build an identity contingent utility or payoff function where individuals have preferences over their own actions and other actions. Uh, very good. Okay, this is the last point that I haven't said before. Individuals may also care about others' actions, and this, there, there, there may be externalities. So it's not only how I behave, but it's how you behave. And if I think you are violating the norms, that might get me upset. And then I may act against you in some way. I may retaliate. So of course this is the source of hate crimes and so on. Oh, it's all coming up in the slides. Very good. All right, so let me go through an education example. So what I want to do is I want to have categories of uh, social categories, white kids and black kids. The norms are that white kids achieve and black kids don't. Black kids who achieve feel themselves or are seen as acting white, right? So this is what Steve alluded to before, which dec decreases the benefits of education. Okay. What's remarkable about this acting white phenomenon, well, whether it's a phenomenon or whether it's not there, but everybody talks about it, of course, we know that's a debate, but what's remarkable is how it's sticky. Okay? So even now, and Obama's been president for four years and he's running for re-election, we still see discussions in the press, and we still see discussions in the African American community that emerge into the press about whether or not it's whether or not a, a kid who goes to um, who goes and succeeds in school and his parents work and he go, goes to college is considered an Uncle Tom. That's still out there in the press, and I can give you details and some examples of that. Uh, if you'd like, after the talk. Now let's do a different example, girls and boys. OK, so and I've now switched. I'm no longer in the developing country context, because I just had to get this in my slides. So there's the norms. Boys do science and math, and girls do literature and art. OK, so this is what's considered to be appropriate behavior and appropriate things to study. And girls who, who achieve in science and math are considered to be geeks. They're less popular, which decreases their benefit of education. Right? And so then girls veer towards the, uh, veer away from the sciences and math, and, and, and um, they do more things like literature and art. Okay? And so this leads to a pattern where girls don't do math, and leads to statements like uh, Lauren, Larry Summers' statement. And so here we have some work that shows that if you, if you, if you look at um, countries, if you sort of do this very simple plot, where you look at countries where um, women, women's rights, women's achievement, et cetera, is more on par with men, the math gap disappears. Okay, and this is work by um, 
Luigi Guizzo, and it's a wonderful paper in science that we should all look at. Now, Guizzo, G-U-I-S-O. Oh. The finding is that if there's a math gap between girls and boys, okay, and you look at that math gap across countries, right? In some countries, there's no math gap. Can you guess which countries those are? Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries, very good. And Iceland, right. <laughs> okay? So it's the countries where the, where the, the, the laws, the, the institutions have reduced the, the, um, the unequal treatment of men and women, right? So men can get paternity leave, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Yeah. I've forgotten. We can all go look at the article. Um, actually, the U.S. is pretty bad on that score. What, the U.S. among these countries has one of the biggest wage gaps mm -hmm. as well. Okay, so now what I want to do is go through... Um, now we're going to look at some specific models to put a little bit of meat on this. And the purpose of going through these models is to give you a sense, a flavor of how economists, the economic theorists may build models where you're introducing a group designation, okay? Um, so the first set of models I'm going to be doing is um, I, inequality is an equilibrium phenomena. So I'm going to be looking at the strategic interaction models. I'm going to give you some examples of strategic interaction models. And then I'm going to give you some examples of um, our identity models, right? So inequality and preferences and identity and social norms. Okay, okay so let me go through the first set. So let me here. here I'm going, let me just remember the order I'm going. Okay. So again, the same, um, the same decision, or actually, that's not right. The same phenomenon is being tried. Is all of the, the models that I'm going to present are trying to describe essentially the same phenomenon. Okay? Essentially. There's going to be differences, of course, because the models are, um, are, 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 are addressing different aspects of the phenomenon where Essentially, African Americans are not um, have worse labor market outcomes. Okay, that's that's the phenomenon that's trying to be described. Okay. Okay. So the first model is a model of statistical discrimination, and I, actually, this was a mistake. I shouldn't have arrow should have appeared bigger on the slides. It's really an arrow model, Ken Arrow's model. Um, sort of adapted by Cote and Lowry. So all of these papers are on the reading list. Okay, um, this is a very interesting paper. What they want to do is build a model of discrimination to study the impact of affirmative action programs. And here's how the model goes. So there's a large number of workers, and these workers come in two types, Bs and Ws. B and W whether a worker is a B or whether a worker is a W is publicly observable. And some fraction of this population are Ws. Okay. There's a large number of competitive employers. And there's two tasks, task 0 and task 1. And the employer assigns workers to tasks. Um, all workers can perform task 0. and it has no, we're just going to normalize the marginal product of that task to zero. Task one requires skilled or qualified labor. Um, and somebody who is placed into task one receives wage W. So I should be clear, what I'm building here is a model where um, this is of the strategic interaction category. Okay, so I'm going to build a model where the equilibrium is going to give me a discriminatory outcome. The equilibrium is going to end up to be discriminatory. OK? Everyone with me? There is no inherent difference between B and W workers to begin with. Nothing. Um, OK, so employers um, returns, if they assign any worker to task 0, they get 0. They acquire a qualified worker to task 1, they get XQ. However, if they make a mistake and assign an unqualified worker to task 1, there's a loss. So the employer actually wants to avoid assigning an unqualified worker to task one. Employers cannot observe if a particular worker is qualified. However, 
the employer can administer a test and obtain a noisy signal, S, that is the probability a worker is qualified. So you think of this as an interview. So a worker shows up at a firm, the, 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 the worker is interviewed, that gives a noisy signal of whether the worker is qualified, the firm then decides whether or not to place the worker in the firm. Um, lots of notation for the distribution of this signal. So I don't have time to go through all of these details. But it's rather standard stuff. So which is basically what you want to know from this is that if the worker is indeed qualified, right, they're more likely to get a higher score on the test. Okay, that's all you really need to know from that. Employers choose thresholds, SW and SB. Okay. So they're going to choose a test score for a W worker and a test score for an SB worker. And they're going to assign workers of that type to the task one if indeed the test score is higher than the threshold. OK? Pretty simple. Are with me? Everyone with me? OK. Now workers <coughs> decide whether or not to become qualified. And they decide whether or not to become qualified by a unit ex ante investment. This investment costs C. It has a cost C. This distribution is G of C. So each individual has some cost. The distribution of these costs across this population is G of C. And importantly, this distribution of costs is the same for B and Ws. So B and Ws have absolutely no underlying difference between them and their cost of making this investment. However, um, the individual worker investment is not observable to employers. So the employers cannot see whether or not a worker has made this investment. They can only give this test. Okay. Workers make this investment before entering the labor market. And the investment decision is going to depend, of course, on future employers' beliefs right, about whether or not they've made the investment and the task assignments. So I'm going to put up the timeline. Here's my timeline. Okay, so this is how it works. So here's time. Stage zero. So the worker wakes up and finds out whether he's a B or a W. The worker invests or not and incurs this cost C, right? So he sees his C and he decides whether he invests or not. The worker is matched with an employer you get this test result Ah. <laughs> okay, so the worker, you know, is tested and there's some result S. And then the worker is assigned to one. Is it zero or one in this model? Is it zero and one? There's another model coming let's later that's that's uh one and two. I forget. Okay, so I have that zero or one, depending on test result, and then they get paid. What? Yeah, well, that's the point. Is the workers the workers forward looking? That's what, that's what the equilibrium is going to be about. The worker's forward looking. He's saying, well, should I invest or not C? Well, that's going to depend on what I think S is. Yes, okay. Exactly. Right, right. And so we're going to do this exactly. So this is why I write up a timeline. This is the timeline of the interaction. And we're going to solve it backwards. So we're going to solve it backwards. Right? First, the employer, we have to think about the employer's decision whether or not where to assign the worker depending on the test result. Right? And then the worker is then going to figure out whether to invest or not. OK? Everybody clear? OK, so good. OK, working backwards. <laughs> We're going to solve for a perfect Bayesian equilibrium. The workers' investment decisions are going to be optimal given the employer's task assignment decisions. 
and the beliefs have to be consistent with the equilibrium strategies. So the employers are considering the posterior probability that a worker of type T is qualified given test score S. Okay. So this is all going on here. This is all going on here. The employer forms a posterior. And this posterior, so the, the probability the worker is qualified. But what does the employer observe? The employer observes two things. The employer observes S, right, which is the test result. And the employer observes the type, T, B, or W. That's the only information that the employer has. Okay. So that's what I have up there. The employer is trying to figure out, is this worker qualified or not? given the test result and the type. Well, the only way that this posterior could be different for workers of different types, if the prior probability that a worker of type T has made an investment is different. Right? You with me? OK. So that's the formula for Bayes' rule <laughs> for this posterior. And here is this important prior, right? This is the prior probability that a worker of type T has made an investment. Okay. So we can just give us notation for that posterior. And so the, work, the employer is going to assign the worker to task one if this posterior is sufficiently high. So here's just the firm's expected payoffs okay, from assigning a worker to task one. Okay. okay, that's just the same equation repeated. So, the employer's threshold to assign a worker to task one or to task two is going to depend on the, these prior probabilities. So the employer could have different thresholds, SW and SB, um, depending on pi W and pi B. It's just coming through that posterior. Okay? So if the prior probability that a work, white worker has invested is bigger than the probability that a black worker has invested, then the threshold for a white worker is higher than the threshold for a low worker. I think I may have that flipped. But that's okay. I think you get the point. So workers make investment decisions. So now we're here. Workers make investment decision given these thresholds. So a worker is going to invest this cost C only if it does not exceed the benefit of making the investment. So a worker of type T who invests will be assigned to task one with probability one minus F of Q ST, the probability that his test score is above S of T, given the worker is qualified. Okay? And a worker of type T who invests will be assigned to task zero with probability one minus F of U S of T, which is the probability the test score is above S of T, given the worker is unqualified. Remember, a worker that's unqualified could still get lucky and pass the test. Okay? All very Clear? All right. So the worker is going to compare benefits and costs. So the expected benefits for a worker are um, V of S, which is just the wage. The, this is, these are just the differences of being assigned to task one, right? Because if you're assigned to task one, you get W. And these are just the probabilities of being assigned to task one, whether you're unqualified or you're qualified. Okay? So there's a benefit from making. Um, making this in investment, which is leading to the difference in these two probabilities. So a worker facing a threshold S prime is going to invest if and only if C is less than these benefits. The cost is less than the benefits. So given some threshold S, the proportion of workers who become qualified is GV of S, is all of the workers who have costs lower than the benefits. And that's what gives you the prior. Okay. So what's the equilibrium? A pair of beliefs, pi w and pi b, will be self-confirming if by choosing the thresholds um, s star pi w and s star b, workers will become qualified at exactly the same rates as postulated by the beliefs. Are you with me? Right? So you have the employers have this belief that one group is investing at a low rate and one, another group is investing at a higher rate. That leads to these thresholds. right? And this is an equilibrium if indeed the workers are investing at exactly the rates postulated 
by the employer. Okay. Okay. That's it. So an equilibrium is a pair of beliefs. That's just what I had before. Right? It's a pair of beliefs satisfying these equations. So this is the, this is the percentage of the pop, this is the uh, proportion of the population that has costs less than the benefits, and this is indeed the proportion of the population that's invested. OK, so what we're essentially doing is looking at this equation, an equation that looks like this, and asking whether indeed I can have multiple solutions to this equation. Can I have this equation where I have a pi w that's not equal to a pi b? Right? So can I have two possible solutions, one where there's a pi w, one where there's a pi b, and these are not equal to each other? And the answer is yes. Okay? So discriminatory equilibria exists under reasonable regularity conditions. What are those reasonable regularity conditions? Those are things, those are conditions on the likelihood ratio, essentially. Continuity of the, um, uh, continuity of the G and um, conditions on the likelihood function. Okay? So in the interest of time, I'm not going to draw the picture, picture here, which I'm going to skip. Um, is I think we, we basically, I can see from all of you nodding out there that you basically understand how this works, right? So it's important, again, this is an example of a model, I think a very nice example of a model where the strategic interaction generates an equilibrium and this equilibrium is discriminatory, okay? But there's no inherent reason why the beliefs should be different for the B's and W's. It's just self-confirming within the context of this model. So this is essentially Arrow's um, statistical discrimination model in a very strategic form, a very nice, well-specified well strategic form. Okay. Um, what's interesting that Code and Lowry do with this model is they then examine affirmative action policies. Okay, so now we have a very well-specified model. We can say, what if we were to introduce an affirmative action policy? How would that affect the outcomes? Well, they distinguish between process-oriented policies and results-oriented policies. A process-oriented <coughs> process policy is, for example, a regulation that requires employers to assign workers with the same test scores to the same task. Okay? So a worker gets a tame, same test score, they must be assigned to the same task. Okay? This would elim eliminate discriminatory equilibria if it could be enforced, right? So what you need to, for such a policy to be enforced, what you actually have to do is see the test results. The test results have to be as clear to a judge, right, who's in, or a regulator who's enforcing this policy as they are to the employer themselves. Okay? So it would be great if we could indeed have a process-oriented regulation. But often it's very difficult to enforce such a, reg such a regulation, so we might think about a results-oriented policy. A results-oriented policy is um, where we don't look at the process, but we look at the results. So we look at the workforce that emerges, and we say, well, what proportion of this workforce is black and what proportion is white? Okay? So it's looking at the outcome of the process, so it's looking at the ratio, say, or the, of, of the blacks and whites in a particular firm, and says, you know what, you're not meeting the criteria. Okay. So they examine um, a particular policy where blacks and whites have to be assigned to task one at the same rate. Right. And they show it can lead to what they call patronizing. So what the work, what the firm is now doing is when they're making this decision here, right, of assigning to zero and one, they're making this decision assigning workers to zero and one under a constraint that's imposed by this policy, by this regulation, that the rates at which they assign uh, workers, black and white workers, has to be the same rate. Okay, so it's in a constraint on this decision. So now a firm, being a profit maximizing firm, is going to have to figure out how to adjust those, how to adjust those um, hiring rules. And in order to meet the requirement, the employers may have to assign B workers to task one, even if the B worker has a low test score. Okay? In order to meet the policy, 
which leads to possibly disincentives for bee workers to invest because they say, hey, I'm going to get assigned to task one just because the employer has to meet this constraint. So this is kind of one of their major messages of the paper. Yes? OK. So what I want to do, so now of course this is, the, the, these words here of course are, are um, a bit charged, right? This is their word, not my word. Um, but, it, and you know, I, I actually, this is something that is discussed a lot about the consequences of affirmative action. I mean, affirmative action is, I put the, the, the wonderful review article on the reading list, right, that you can go through and look at sort of the, the myths and mythology, whatever it's called, that is a great title of affirmative action. Um, what I wanted to do is to present this model. It's a classic model of discrimination, of workforce, of labor force discrimination. It's the, basically a statistical discrimination model. It's Arrow's statistical discrimination model done in a very nice, uh, you know, well-specified game. And then it's simple enough that we can also use it to examine policy. Okay, now, of course, they, you know, there are regulations which will eliminate discriminatory equilibria, and there are regulations which won't. Yes. The results about the disincentive to invest seems to me to be. Can you speak louder? I'm sorry. Sorry. It seems to me, uh, I think, that the results about the disincentive to invest is very driven by the binary nature of the test results, uh, right? Because if you had a more um, continuous or categorical result. No, the test result can be, the test result is any number between 0 and 1. Well, because the employer, well, so what, you would, what you would want is possibly that there's, there's a task for every test result. But I still don't think, you're still, as long as you can, the test is not perfect. As long as the test is not perfect and does not fully reveal whether a worker is qualified or not, you're going to get this problem. Um, yeah, I don't think that would change anything because that, well, so first of all, it's not my model, it's their model. Uh, second of all, I don't think that would change, um, I don't think that would change much because what, in the, see, this is, this is the problem, this is both the beauty and the problem of writing down a model. You write down the model, the, the game form gives you what the available moves are, okay? Those available moves are restricted, right? So it could be that in the world out there, and this I'm very much going to talk about when I get to the next model, in the world out there, what workers are going to do is figure out some other way to demonstrate that they're qualified, and that gets us to signaling and so forth. There's no signaling possible in this model. This is not a signaling model. So we've written down a particular game form. It has a particular structure to it. Workers or actors can do certain things at certain times. Whether or not that reflects the environment, and perhaps the very creative environment which these actors may find themselves, is a question to be judged by the reader of the article, right? There's a bit of an aesthetic to that. We say, oh, it's kind of, we know we can't capture everything, but does it capture the essence, right? And, you know, and then, of course, that can be discussed. Yes? Just to follow up, I do think an interesting question is the mechanism behind one. In other words, they're considering two very specialized policies. And the first one, at least to me, is not a firm of action and a discrimination statute. Uh, it would be interesting to know whether or not there are a rule following that they're calling the uh, results-oriented that actually can eliminate the... Uh... Right, so I should say that um, uh, there are some conditions under which this, this works and it doesn't work. So this is not always leads to patronizing. It's going to lead under patronizing under certain conditions. And so... Probably. So we don't. We it's not that not a, a fair question to me. It's merely an observation that paper took this very extreme view of what affirmative action means to get patronized and equilibrium. I think if the additional model, it is an interesting question to ask whether or not more sophisticated variations of uh, the results are in affirmative action. Right. And I think that to, to build on that is both more sophisticated regulation. Well, first of all, in the model, it's hard to get more sophisticated regulation because this is the model that they have. But the other is that if there might be simple things that one could introduce here 
right, other moves by other players that one could then perhaps work with those and regulate on those as well. So I, I think we're agreeing. We're just elaborating on the point. Yeah. So <laughs> just a clarification on what you're saying about it being strong conditions or there are conditions for taking money. If those conditions are not met, we it seems obvious that this can also improve people's incentive to invest yes. as well. Sure. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. So there are conditions under which one of them is the W is a large part of the population. That was the mu that I had floating around before. So, uh, real quick. Yeah, I just wanted to say, how should we think about this in relationship to like, the framework that you leave of <clears throat> for identity economics? Like, should we think about this as in, in the same way that like, you know, the dummies that we throw into interaction show us that you kind of care about identity, but we need to develop a more sophisticated perspective of identity discrimination is just another way in which. Okay, so this is, okay, so if we, if we want to go to the point, so, the, the, so we have this dummy variable that says, you know, you put in the dummy variable for African American and it comes out negative or something, right? So they get lower probability of, of high wages, I don't know, something like this, right? What could be going on behind that? Okay, here we've got one explanation, right? There's statistical discrimination going on, okay? So is... Um, I'm going to build, uh, this is, a, this is a, a model or an explanation that's very old about labor market discrimination. So Ken Arrow, you know, uh, is the originator of this idea, okay? So when I, the word identity has, I'm now kind of using that to, um, how can I say this? Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't confuse everyone. The identity models that George and I are building, this is not one of them. This is a, this is a, this is a, I'm giving you sort of a historical perspective on the way in which economists have tried to understand these patterns, right? Where groups have mattered, racial group, ethnic groups, gender, and so on, okay? Now, you know, sort of fast forward to today, we're now calling this identity, but Arrow did not use the word identity. I don't think so. So, okay? Because so identity could just be a mere descriptor. Could we say, say somebody's black? But the content of that is what we're building on. So, so sorry, I'm gonna. I, I, I need to. If I'm going to get through some of these other ones, I'm gonna need to move on. But there was a question here. Is that clear enough? I just was trying to get a sense of like um, how, how. So basically, we should look at this as a part of the history of the yes. of the book. Yes. It's so so it, it's back to this disincentive thing. It is, what I mean is a disincentive relative to which equilibrium. So there's there's multiple equilibrium, right? In this model. Yeah, we, we're in a discriminatory equilibrium. Yeah, and, and but okay, okay. So I mean, I, I just I, I I I kind of think that if there must always be an equilibrium where no yeah. B workers get education. No, they do, but at a lower rate. There's always, first of all, in this, in, okay, let's be very careful. So, you, so I, I sort of, uh, let me just go back to this thing here. There's two steps to figuring out equilibria. First is, is there any equilibrium at all? So forget the W's here, forget the W's and the B's, and just have a pi with no, no subscript. First thing you want to know, can you get this to work? That's the existence of one equilibrium. Then you say, well, can I get two equilibria? What two equilibria are is when I have this working for one pi w and one pi, uh, pi w here, and it working for another value, pi b, here. That would be two equilibria. There could be many more than that. There could be five, right? OK? So we're, a discriminatory equilibrium is simply the fact that you could have a pi, uh, you know, Two different pies can work in this equation. Sure. No, I or five. It. Uh, it, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. And then the, 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 the okay. I, yeah. So what worries me is that if there is a continuum of equilibria, and then if we eliminate just yeah, there's there's no continuum because of the single peak. There, this, this thing is single peak, so you're so, not going to get a continuum. So do, uh, oh, but what's the cardinality of the on the set of equilibria? They. Uh, Let's see. Um, they say there exists at least two. They just say there exists at least two. They don't, but it's definitely, I know there's not a continuum. I don't know if they address the cardinality per se. 
Okay. What well, worries me is that if the set of equilibria is really large, and then if we say that then, you know this set uh, well, force eliminates one equilibrium, this could have very little predictive power on uh, what's going to happen if we implement that policy, because at the end of the day, the problem yeah. is that Yeah, so this is, this is the issue of game theory. This is the problem with game theory. When you have multiple equilibria, you, you know, we have no theory of equilibrium selection. So the way this policy exercise is done is say start with an equilibrium, right, and impose this policy. Okay. All right. So what I want to now do is um, build for you another model, and um, this model is um, George Akerlof's cast model. So again, this is now, you know, just so we're not confused, this is still in history. This is in economic, the history of economic thought on <coughs> discrimination. This is a rather, um, I mean, this is an early paper. Um, the reason I want to present this paper is it, I think, um, I think this is what most economists have in mind when they think of social norms at least up until 10 years ago, when George and I started writing this other stuff, and other people started writing. This is, I think, the classic notion of what people think of as social norms. Here a social norm is going to be emerging from a repeated game. OK? So this is kind of the, 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 the basic, the, the very first understanding, very first set of models that's trying to um, build a social norm as an equilibrium. It's also a very useful model for understanding um, some social processes and inequalities. So here we're going to build a model where strategic interaction generates equilibrium inequality. Right? So we're going to have e inequality in this um, model as an equilibrium, and it's going to be bad. It's going to be a bad social norm. Okay? It's going to be a bad equilibrium. Okay? So there's multiple equilibria here as well, this is, but we're going to show you that when the bad one exists. Okay, here's how the model goes. <coughs> I'm sorry. We've got many competitive firms. Each firm produces one of n different products. There are three types of jobs at the firms. We've got skilled jobs, unskilled jobs, and what's called scavenging jobs. A firm's output depends on the quantity of labor employed and the jobs performed. So, um, a worker could be assigned to a skilled job, in which case this is his product, marginal productivity, right? He could be assigned to an unskilled job, in which case this is his productivity. There's only one word. Yeah, it's called, marginal productivity is kind of a funny word to use here, but anyway. And if he's assigned to a scavenging job, that's his productivity. And how much quantity a firm I produces is just simply the sum of the labor assigned to particular jobs. You got that? So workers here, excuse me, workers here are completely undifferentiated, right? There's workers here, they're, they're not qualified, unqualified, they're just workers. The question is, what job are they assigned to? Are they designed to sweep the floor, right? Or are they designed to be at the front desk and greet customers? Okay, so there's just the different kinds of jobs that the workers can be assigned to. Now, there are customers out there. These customers have homogeneous tastes and they have concave utility. The utility is, um, as I've written up here, the minimum, sorry, it's the sum over the minimum of Xi and A. So Xi here is the consumption of product I. Okay. And, but consumers, only want to consume up to A amount of each product. So once they've consumed A of each product, that's it, they don't want any more. Okay, you with me? So consumers like lots of different things. Instead of, instead of being able to consume one product, a lot of one product, they actually want to consume many products. This is a particular form of a concave utility. Is everybody clear on this? Because this A is actually really important. Does everybody get what A is? There are just so many oranges I can eat. At some point I want apples as well and bananas and so on. Okay. So now I'm going to put on a social structure. We're going to posit a social structure and corresponding strategies. These strategies are a social norm. Okay. And we're going to determine when this structure and this social code, actually this, this should be code, I meant to, 
code. One of these should be, say, code. Because that's the word that's used in the paper. We're to determine when the structure and the code can be sustained in equilibrium. Okay? So by birth, um, the workers are born of two different castes, dominant caste and non-dominant caste. Okay? So it's a little bit like having a label in the forehead N and D, just like B and W. Okay? There are two castes, dominant and non-dominant. Labor of both castes can be outcasted, and outcasts, if there are any, would constitute a third group. Okay? So people are not born outcasted, but that could happen through the social interaction. And here is the caste code, or the social code. D labor should only be assigned skilled jobs. Right? N labor should only be assigned unskilled jobs. And O labor should only be assigned scavenging jobs. Okay, this is just the code. Part of the code is that all persons, I guess, all people who purchase from firms violating the code are outcasted. Okay? And outcasts receive wage for outcast labor. This is the code. Okay? And we now have to see whether this code can be sustained in an equilibrium. Okay, you guys with me? So th here's the idea. What you want to think about, um, so th this is, the word caste is of course used in not it by not by uh, coincidence, the idea you know, could be representing castes in India, right? There's where a lot of the castes were traditionally related to certain kinds of jobs. So the idea here is that the society um, has this code where certain people can be assigned to the good jobs and other people assigned to the not good jobs. So I think this also describes the US South pretty well, right? There's people who could just not be in the front of the store. Right? The white guy would be in the front of the store, and the African American would be in the back of the store. Right? And then you have the customers, and the customers, the customer is going to patronize a store where the black guy is in front. And what would happen to them if they actually went to the store where the, black, the, the, the store itself, the store owner, was violating the social code? What would happen in such a society? Right? And what we're going to do is show the conditions under which no firm actually wants to hire a non dominant person, a uh, non-dominant um, cast member, and put them in the front. Because they won't get any customers. And they won't get any customers. Why? Because the customer who buys from them is going to be outcasted, is going to be shunned, and is going to get a lower wage, and so on. Okay? And so we're going to show the conditions under which such a cast code can constitute an equilibrium. Is everybody ready? OK, so I want WK to denote the wage that cast K receives. And PI denotes the price of good I produced by a firm that follows the code. And here's the strategies and the payoffs. Let's have all, all agents follow the cast code. Um, each cast in equilibrium, right? Each cast gets paid his marginal product. So the dominant guys get this higher wage. The non-dominant guys get this lower wage, right? Because those are the jobs that they're assigned to, right? The price for firms, um, the price for uh, each firm following the code is actually we're one. Well, we, there was a numeraire that gave us one. Okay, the utility of D labor. So, what is the D labor? What do they get? Well, they get paid. You know, they're, they're, they get assigned to this skilled job, so they get paid this amount, right? Right. And we go back to the utility function. You see, that's how much they get to consume. And the utility of end labor is this lower amount, right? So end labor has lower wages, lower consumption. Firms earn zero profits. We're in a competitive world here. And the highest wage bid for any outcast labor is its marginal product, right? Because we've got, we've, again, we're in the world of competitive firms. OK, whoops. OK, so that's where we were. I just specified the strategies. And I specified the payoffs each firm, each firm and each consumer would get in equilibrium. So now I have to ask, would any firm or any consumer have an incentive to deviate? And if the answer is no, then this CAS code is in equilibrium. Right? So I'm showing when these strategies constitute a perfect equilibrium. So here's the proposition for sufficiently low A and sufficiently large N. 
which means consumers want to buy many different products, no firm can profitably break the CAS code. Okay. okay, so let's consider a firm's incentive to deviate from the code. Well, let's think about this firm. This firm is hiring D labor and putting D labor in these high skilled jobs and N labor in the low skill in the low skilled jobs, right? But you know, these N labor, they're actually just as good as the D labor, right? They're just as good as the D labor. So what a firm might think of doing is, well, hey, I can get these N labor cheaper than the D labor, right? Because all of these other stupid firms out there, what they're doing is they're hiring the N labor, putting them in unskilled jobs and not paying them very much. So what I'm going to do, I'm the smart firm, I'm going to say, I'm going to hire the N, N labor at a lower wage than the D labor and sell at a lower price. And I'm going to make money, right? That's a smart firm. So that's what I said. So I'm going to put N labor in skilled jobs and get more output, but, but I'm going to pay lower wage. But a consumer who patronizes such a firm is outcasted. So we have to consider the incentives to purchase from a firm which breaks the code in this way and the incentives to hire an outcast worker. So the first thing I have to think of about is will a firm be interested in deviating in this way? And it will only be interested in deviating in, in this way if a customer is going to show up. But the customer could be punished, so we have to check whether the punishment of the customer is credible, right? This is how we make sure it's a perfect equilibrium. Everybody, we're all good? Okay. Okay, so let's see what happens. So the firm deviates, the firm hires N workers for a skilled job, but they get to pay them um, a lower wage than they hire D labor. So they only get to pay them, they, they're basically paying them what they get at the alternative firm plus a little bit. And they sell at price P. So the firm earns at most per unit profits, right? They can sell, um, this, is, this is how much they can um, get from this guy. They sell at price P, but they're paying this lower wage, right? So the deviation is profitable only if P, right, is larger than this number here, right? It's basically then their, 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 um, the difference in the wages. So will anyone buy from the firm at this price? Remember this P is lower, right? than the P that they could buy from another firm. So a customer would be outcasted. So I'm going to check the credibility of that later. No, remember, I've got to check for it. Okay. So a customer will be outcasted. So the customer that is outcasted um, earns wage SC, right? He's outcasted. So he's only going to be hired for these scavenging jobs. He's going to buy up to A units from the deviating firm. He likes this deviating firm because the deviating firm is charging him a lower price. So he likes doing that. So he's going to buy as much as he can from that firm. But he's got to buy the rest at this higher price. But he's got this lower budget right, than he had before. Because instead of SC here, he had SK. Okay. So his total utility, if he's buying from this deviating firm, is A plus the scavenging wage minus what he buys from the firm with the lower price. So his total utility is at most, this is the most that this consumer can get by buying from the firm which deviates and offers him a lower price. Okay. Lower price is good, but then the guy's outcasted. It all sort of happens at once. This is a, this is a, a sort of a pre-game theory model. This is what they call, it's like, it's, it's like a, a, I hate to use the word rational expectations when I'm talking about George, but it's kind of like a rational expectations model. <laughs> OK, so, so let's consider the consumer with the most incentive to buy from the deviating firm. It's the guy who um, is the end consumer, right? So this is, the most he could, whoops, this is the most he could earn. I had that up there before. And he's not going to want to buy from the deviating firm. If, what, what I want to do is I want to compare what he got when he didn't buy from the deviating firm and what he gets when he does buy from the deviating firm. And the consumer will not want to buy from the deviating firm if A is sufficiently small. Okay? So the logic, what's going on here, is the consumer wants to buy a lot of different products. So it's not attractive to buy just from one low price firm, but then lose all your friends. This is now elaborating from beyond the model. Lose all your friends, get outcasted, you know, don't get invited to the, to the ball, whatever it might be. You know, don't go to have tea with anyone. It's not worth it, okay? 
because I want to buy from many possible firms, so I've actually my budget matters, right? I, I want to have more, I, I want to be able to earn more money. Now, I do need to check that a consumer will indeed be outcasted, right? So now I've got to check the credibility of this punishment. So what's happening, remember, is this consumer is buying from this firm. The, 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 he's being, the, the, the consumer is being outcasted and earning this lower wage. But let's think about that a second. This worker out there is now really cheap, right? She, this worker who's been outcasted is earning this really low wage because they're now this outcast person. So maybe a firm would want to hire them. Okay, so we're going to go through the same exercise. Right? Okay, is the punishment credible? We're going to consider a firm that hires O labor, right? So another firm says, well, there's this outcast person out there. Okay, what will happen? Well, maybe I can hire this O labor at this really low wage, so just a little bit above what they might be getting and sell at price P. Go through the same exercise. The firm is putting this outcast labor, but in a skilled job, so as, you know, sort of getting a lot of productivity, right, is able to charge a price slightly lower than everybody else and make money. Will anyone buy from this firm? Guess what we have to do? The same construction. We do it again, right? The consumer will be outcasted if they buy from the firm that hires the outcast labor. And we go through the same thing again, right, and we get a condition on A, another condition on A. All right? So. No firm will have an incentive to break this CAS code because no consumer will want to buy from a firm that breaks this CAS code, right? Because the consumer is indeed credibly punished from buying from this firm that broke the CAS code if A is sufficiently small. <laughs> A sufficiently small is basically ensuring that the customers want to buy from several firms, that you can't just have an independent firm and an independent consumer. So the equilibrium is sustained by credible punishments, and we have a social norm. So any, OK, that's what I just said. So this is a bad equilibrium. It's a bad social norm. This is incredibly inefficient, right? We have all of these workers, which are absolutely identical, but a lot of them, right, all of the N ones are stuck in these unskilled jobs. So how can we get out of this? Right? So OK, I should back up <laughs> before I go into how can we get out of this. This is, um, I think, so if you look at how the literature has gone from this, then, then you can imagine there's the game theory revolution within economics, and we now have a full theory of repeated games. This is a repeated game, and you just have this series of punishments, and a series of punishments can sustain anything in equilibrium. So the folk theorem, you guys have all learned the folk theorem, right? The folk theorem, right, tells you that any outcome can be sustained in equilibrium, right? So even a really bad one. All right, so you could have a bad social norm. How can you get out of this? Um, one possibility that you could get out of this is that there could be coordination. Um, so we've looked at one single firm deviating. But what if sufficiently many firms violate the code all at the same time? Right? You can essentially create a sub-economy, and consumers can buy many products from the deviating firm. So you need a group to move together. Right, so there has to be a coordination to get out of this bad equilibrium. Another way to get out of this is a policy. Suppose that discriminatory hiring is now, is now um, punished. Right, there's a fine right, for putting workers of different types in different jobs. This creates a cost for following the code. Right, so the following the code is now costly. So a firm would be more interested in not following the code. Okay. And so this, is, um, I, this model is, is very nice because it shows us sort of the structure that, um, of how these social norms are created and sustained in equilibrium. It also gives us a sense of what can solve it. And indeed, if we look out there, we can see that some bad norms, bad social norms, indeed have ended through coordination and by policy. So some people will argue that the discrimination in the U.S. South, uh, a lot of employers were very happy right, with the Civil Rights Act because they were stuck hiring workers right, and putting them in inefficient positions. Okay.
Yes. Just a very modern related question. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that if I allow consumer to set their food, then the equilibrium breaks down for any alpha, as long as you want. And it seems to me that like in many of the societies where there is a tax system, there are also a lot of secondary markets. Like the definition between buyers and sellers, like in in uh, markets in Africa or Asia, it would be very difficult to establish. Like everybody could be a seller at some point and a buyer at another point. Boy, I'm not sure about secondary markets in this model. I'd have to think about it. Um, yeah, but you've got money. You, you have to earn money too. The reason why consumers, the reason why consumers don't want to buy from a punishing firm is because they can't earn money. So the consumers themselves are punished for patronizing the firm with a lower price. So they've got a budget constraint because they have to work too. So if they so if we had it introduced a credit market and blah 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 you know but, but in the context of the model the the reason why the customer is not willing to buy from a firm that breaks the cast code is because the customer is going to have a lower wage right the customer is punished yeah yeah no that's why I was saying all the related I'm not sure it works it seems to me that it would work but it's an equation well again you know there's um, Okay, let me tell you something that could happen in this model. If you introduced one consumer with, in, with unlimited income, this would go away. But the consumer here is part of the society, has to work within the society, has to earn wages within the society. Okay. All right. Um, so let's think about how we want to use our time. I started, I think, an hour and a half ago, almost exactly. That's about right. Now, um, I know what Jim would tell me to do. Just keep going. So I, I, what I would, let me tell you, <laughs> what, I, what I could do is I can finish this part, and then we can take a break and come back for the second part. Um, is, we're all OK? We're all, anyone want some water? Anyone need water? OK, we're good. All right. OK, <laughs> so now I'm going to build you a third model. This is. Um, I wouldn't call this in the history of, of the literature. This is, all, this is a very recent paper. And it's a model where workers signal. And this is, um, they signal to, um, to show that they are loyal to their community. And they signal by not getting an education. Okay? So this is a model, they're trying to build a model of this acting white phenomenon. So um, we all know what signaling games are about. Um, people choose an action to signal, signal some underlying desirable attribute. Here, people signal their sociability by not achieving in school. So here's how the model goes. We've got three sets of agents, <laughs> um, individuals, firms, and now we have a peer group. Okay, so we've got another actor here. Individuals have two hidden characteristics. There's a social type that's either low or high, and there's an economic type. Okay. The distribution of the characteristics are known, so there's some probability you know, uh, that people are high, and the economic types have a cumulative density function. Okay. Fine. So that's known. Um, however, this type here is private information. So individuals have a type T, which consists of their sociability type and their economic type, and it's private information, like in all signaling models. Individuals are endowed with a unit of time, and they decide how much education to obtain, S. The cost of education depends on the economic type. So your cost of education depends on how much S you get and your type. And all of these are the typical assumptions you make that it's cheaper to get the education if you have a higher economic type, OK? Right, standard stuff. OK, more standard stuff. The marginal product of a worker, from the point of view of a firm, is a function of education and phi. So here, education um, is going to matter to the firm. The firm actually cares about the education per se, which is a little bit different than the, than the Spence model you probably all learned in the first year. Okay, so it's just a little twist on that. Okay. And uh, phi. Firms are competitive. They pay the expected marginal product. But the problem is that they can observe S, but they cannot observe phi. So the firms can observe the education level that workers have achieved, but they can't observe the underlying economic type. So
So pretty much the assumptions are almost standard for a spent signaling model, except we've now add a second audience and a second motivation. The second motivation is the peer group. The peer group is interested in the sociability of the individual. And the individual wants to be accepted by the peer group. Okay? So this is we've added another actor to a Spence model. The peer group is actually only interested in accepting the high guys. Okay, so we'll just skip to that. The little notation which is going to appear later, we're going to have this A equals 1 if an individual is accepted, and A equals 0 if the individual is not accepted. The individuals also want to be in the peer group. So the peer group wants high quality, high sociability individuals. The individual wants to be accepted into the peer group if they are highly sociable, okay? Because they have leisure time. Our workers actually do something when they're not at work. They hang out, and when they hang out, they get, this is their hang, this is what they do when they're, well, it's actually when they're not in school. They're hanging out. And their utility from leisure depends on whether they are a high or low type. Okay? We're going to make um, when A equals 0, you're not accepted into the group. And so this whole thing disappears. And you get no value of leisure time. Okay? And so this is a worker's overall utility. You get a wage. This is your leisure time. right? And this is your cost of S. Now, this wage here is going to depend on S2. I just haven't put it in there yet. Right? I'm sorry. Got to speak up. Is the peer group exogenous? Yeah. The peer group's exogenous. OK, everybody OK? OK, so the peer group wants high, high sociability types. High sociability types want to be accepted by the peer group because they get higher utility from leisure time. Uh, timeline. Let me put the timeline up. I'll find my timeline. Here's my timeline. Okay, so what happens first? Individuals know their own type. So first thing, the individuals know their own type. Individuals choose a level of education. Firms, well, Firms make wage offers. Um, depending on S. Uh, peer group. What does a peer group do? The peer group accepts or rejects the worker depending on S as well. Now oh, and then I guess we get payoffs. OK. All right. So now we see how it works. And again, we do the typical thing. And we want to understand you know, how the workers are going to be choosing S understanding the wage offers, understanding how the peer group is going to be accepting or not, given their S decisions and so on. Okay. So we are looking here for sequential equilibrium, because we've got this private information here. Uh, lots of technical, technical things we have to worry about. But for now, I'm just going to talk about that agents have to act optimally given their types and the actions of other agents, and the beliefs have to be consistent with the equilibrium actions. How much do I want to go into this? Okay, so th let's just do a complete information benchmark. So when we typically analyze these models, what we want to do is uh, we want to first assume that uh, as a benchmark, suppose that both of these factors are known. Sociability is known and economic type is known. 
Firms simply pay the worker's marginal product. The peer group accepts high types and rejects low types. Individuals choose S to maximize utility, right? I just move backwards here. High sociability types are going to choose a lower S. Why? Because they have higher returns to leisure, right? Everybody with me? It's all very easy. And there are some, uh, I just wrote down the utility for reference if we need it. Okay, good. So that would be the complete information benchmark. All is, life is good. Let's skip that. Let's skip the tech, some of the technical stuff. So now let's go to um, some, well, this is th actually, this is just saying that the high guys get lower education than the low guys, right? The high sociability types, right, have a higher value of leisure. So they're going to get lower um, education. Now let's consider two partial information scenarios. One, we can imagine the social type is observable, but the economic type is not. Or the economic type is observable, but the social type is not. And these are essentially single audience sig signaling problems. Okay? And then later we'll consider the two audience signaling problem, where both types are not observable. Okay, partial, partial observation case one. The social type is observable, but the economic type is not. Okay? Type number one. The peer group, all they care about is high sociability types, so they accept only high sociability types. And the individuals use S to signal the economic types to firms. And we're done. It's just a Spence model, except now we've got these workers who are divided into people who are in the peer group versus people who are not. And the only thing we should really think that's sort of different than a signaling model, typically, is that now um, the, it is true that the lower, ooh, OK, it is true that the high sociability workers are going to be getting lower levels of education, right? High, well, again, let me say it again. High sociability workers are going to be getting lower levels of education. So you think, well, why isn't the firm fooled by that? Well, remember, the firm can observe sociability. So they say, oh, you're a high sociability guy. I know why you're getting a lower level of education. But I still know that you actually have a high phi, so I'm going to pay you that much. OK? That's how it works. So this is an efficient outcome. There's no signaling, There's no signaling costs per se. Um, uh, uh, this is actually wrong statement. Bad, bad. It's cut. Yeah. Okay. This is wrong. Uh, there are signaling costs, but signaling costs only coming from one audience. Okay. Okay. As to the other case, the economic type is observable, but the social type is not. The firms are now uh, um, paying according to S and W. Okay. So the firms can actually observe. Right? They actually can observe phi, so they just pay them. And um, we're going to get a separating equilibrium where the low sociability guys say, well, forget the peer group, who cares? I'm just going to get the optimal S right? and not worry about being accepted. And the high sociability guys, well, they actually like being the peer group, so they're going to adopt a higher level of S, right? and they get accepted. Simple. Okay, so you have this bifurcation of these uh, of the uh, on S, and the peer group, of course, rejects the people that are taking the low level of education, and they're accepting the people that undertake the high level of education, and everything works, and we have no signaling costs on the other side, only on one side. Good. All right. Now, um, let's have both economic types and social types not being observable. So obviously, this is the key case, firms are going to pay according to S and the inferred phi that they're getting from S. The peer groups are also accepting or rejecting according to the sociability type, which they can only infer from S. And they're going to reject if S is greater than some threshold. Okay. So in all equilibria, worker strategies have the following form. The way the equilibria is going to work is that low sociability individuals are going to separate by phi. Okay? So they're going to adopt a, um, a level of education. The lowest economic type adopts the optimal level of education given that they're not going to be accepted. And then they separate up from that. So then up from that, you have the higher types have to do even higher in order so the low guys don't mimic them. So the low product, the low sociability types act as if they're in a Spence model. They don't care about this peer group. They just forget about it. 
The high sociability types, however, they are they have to <coughs> distinguish themselves from the low productive from the low sociability types, and they do that by under by under um, investing in education. Okay, because remember now the firm can't tell who's who, so they can't use that information, and the only thing anybody has to go on is S. So the workers, actually now I'm going to draw a picture. <laughs> I think the way I can show you this best is with a picture. Let me show you the picture I have for this. This is the way that an equilibrium would look. All right, so. We've got S on this axis here and phi on this axis here. Here's a, a benchmark. So this is S star for the um, low productivity guy. Sorry, this is the um, low sociability guy. This is the low sociability guy who's got the lowest economic cost and he doesn't care about being accepted by the peer group. Okay, this is what he gets. And then we have some schedule that goes up like that. These is all for the lowest, the low, the low sociability types. Okay, so that's what they do. Then the high guys, the high sociability types, what they end up doing is getting this low level of education up until this value here, let's call this, these are the theta L's and the theta H's that are up there on the slide. And then these guys jump up and then follow here. So here we've got the high sociability, high phi guys, they're up here. And these are the high sociability, low phi guys. And here we're going to call this S hat, and the peer group accepts for S less than or equal to S hat, and the peer group rejects for S greater than S hat. And that's an equilibrium. Okay, so everyone see how it works? So the peer group say, okay. You know, if you've got S less than or equal to half, I'm going to accept you. If you've got S bigger than that, I'm not, right? So low productivity, the, the, low, the low phi guys, actually for them, it's better to be accepted in the peer group than not. So they're all going to be down here at this low education level. But for the high productivity guys, the high economic types, eventually it's not worth it for them to be accepted to the peer group. So what do they do? They jump up to this schedule. Okay? That's essentially how it works. Right? So we've got... Um, it's completely due to information asymmetries. And here is the criticism. This could be the same for any community. There's nothing here which tells me that this is blacks and whites. So this is all supposed to be about acting whites, but absolutely nothing in the model has told me that these are blacks and whites. So it could be the same for any community. You should predict the same phenomenon for any ethnic or any racial group or any group of workers, right? right? So there's nothing here. There's only one parameter that can be varied, and it's the value of being accepted or rejected. Uh, it's the value that a peer group has for accepting or rejecting an individual. That's it. It's the only variable that can be varied. So for example, if we wanted to compare a white community and a black community, that's the only thing we have. And it doesn't match, it doesn't map into any other criterion, any other measure we may have about these different communities. Okay. So well, this is a nice model. It's, again, very clearly spelled out. We can get a sense of how signaling can work. The question is, does it really get at acting white? Okay. Because there's nothing here which tells me these are about blacks and whites. And there's nothing that tells me about this phenomenon of acting white, per se. And nothing about all of these conversations that are in the press about acting white is in the model at all. Okay. But it's still a nice model. But it's not that implicit in the whatever is the peer group. I mean, is that important? 
So it could be. Well, why should blacks be more concerned about pair groups than whites? Why why should blacks like hanging out more than whites like hanging out? Oh, uh, they just want. I mean, it doesn't matter. But you just want to belong to to your social group. So. Right, but the thing is, is that suppose you want to belong to a social group, right? Why should social groups have? Yeah, pe people like to be in their social group. That's fine. So whites like to be in a social group too, in their social group. But should be well. What? You, you quite possibly expect how much you like it to be well dependent. Maybe that, but that should be in the model. So I'm, I'm quite willing to believe that there may be something to do with the community and the community benefit from from something going on, but it's not in the model. That's all I want to say at this point. There's nothing in the model that gets at things like this. That perhaps, for example, that poorer communities put a greater value on people being in the peer group. But that, but then, so suppose we were to do that. Okay? In this model, the peer group does not care about how much money a worker makes. They don't care about that. All that they care about is the hanging out value. So if we want to introduce wealth, so the poor people, you know, want people to be in their peer group and it's more valuable to them, well, maybe they should also care about the members of their peer group being employed. But that is explicitly ruled out here. Yeah? But, uh, so what you're saying, and then you make the assumption that the, the sizes of the groups are even. Nope. But no, no, there's only, there's, in fact, there's no, there's no group size in here. There's no two different groups. No, but not here, but in the reality there is. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So for instance, in, in terms of in a community of immigrants, mm -hmm. I mean, added to the value of hanging out is also the, let's say, like the fact of not uh, the disappearance of the culture of, of the group is a question also. So there could be this value of accepting or rejecting an individual from the peer group, right? So that's a possibility. But what I want then, if that's the case, is that we want to build that into the model that there's something about this is, a hang, this, is a, this is a hanging out model. It's not about the preservation of the culture. Okay? So what we want to do is build into the model the value of the peer group, the value of the community, per se. And here it's, 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 it's not sufficiently rich to get at that. And I would say I would want to build that into these models, into a model like this. So one can interpret it what you're saying is that a peer that pure social interaction model is not enough to qualify as an integrity model. As a what? As an integrity, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, I, I, identity no. model. No, well, first of all, an identity model is, <laughs> that I'm going to now add the identity. None of these models have been, quote unquote, an identity model yet. Yes. No, so I, I, no, I, I, I don't want to be too critical. Um, all of these models highlight some features of the of the um, of this what you might call racial inequality or discrimination and so on. Do I think statistical discrimination is out there? Yes, right. I do think that's out there. Do I think that this repeated game stuff going on, you know, that I would talk about with you know with Akerlof, um, is out there? Yeah, it's out there, right. Do I think signaling is going on? Yeah, I think signaling is going on too. I think that, but to get deeper, right, into what, 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 you know, you know, what is sort of behind what, 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 sorry, what these models don't have yet, what none of the models have yet is something that is inherently about a social norm per se, that is really about people understanding themselves as part of different groups. Nothing here has people being part of different groups, and and, and understanding. That there is, like you said, the value of the culture, for example. It's not here in these models. That's not to say that these models might not be getting at some aspects. Absolutely. That's, it's, it's all, you know, where it's, I think these are, in some sense, complementary or perhaps, in some sense, competitive approaches. Okay, but these models are all missing something. And that's what I'm getting to next. Not to say that they're in value, they're in value but they are missing something. Everybody good on that? It's not the case that this model is missing what the model is trying to explain. So this model is trying to explain the, the, the effect of the peer group, and then there is no peer group formation in the model. So Very what good. the explain is missing from the model. Okay. That's a little bit puzzling. 
No, I agree. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we should invite them next time. Um, well, you know, they, I, I can tell you what they'll say about my models. So it's okay. We're all we're all friends. Right. Okay. So let's quickly do this. So what I want to do is build a model where individuals think of themselves and others more or less consciously in terms of social categories. So now I want to have people have tastes but also norms how people should behave. And people have utility from their own actions and others' actions. People internalize norms and punish others who violate the social codes. And I want to use this utility function to study minority poverty. Okay, so there was a question about what came first, the identity versus the, nor the norms and the actions. It was around before. Uh, okay, but here we're going to go. So I'm going to start, how do we build the general framework? We start with a standard model of utility. The utility of a person J is represented as you know, some value of A, J, and A, not J, where A, J are J's actions and A, not J are others' actions. And the inclusion of A, not J captures the possibility of externalities or strategic interaction, right? So for example, A, J is the effort of person J in school. A, not J is the effort of others in school, which may hurt or help J's academic achievement. Okay, so you can just, this is all standard stuff so far. So you have a peer group effect, social interaction effect, as, as we sort of know and love them. Now we want to add identity ingredients. And we want to add identity ingredients. There's the three basic ones. We want to add a set of social categories, C, an individual J's assignment of self and others to these categories, and the norms, N, that give the appropriate behavior and ideal attributes of each social category. And then we have a utility function, which is amended by this little term, IJ where AJ or J's actions, A not J or others actions, and IJ is J's self-image. Okay. And this identity function, I'll repeat it up here. This, there, there's this little identity function here. Right now it's extraordinarily general. Right? I'm just writing down what I think are the important ingredients for a model with identity in them. So this identity utility here is this new term, this little IJ. This is this new term. What's going on there? So overall utility depends on how AJ and A not J affect the economic utility and how they affect the self-image. Okay, so that's the regular utility and that's the identity utility. The self-image depends on acting as you should, which is the match between actions and the category norms. So do you act as I should? Um, do you fit in? Do you the match between J's attributes and the ideals of the category, which are given um, by N? and the status of the assigned category, which is given by the function itself. Okay, so in the basic case, person J chooses AJ to maximize utility, taking as given the category assignment, his own attributes, and the norms. In general, however, a person could act to change their own category, own attributes, and societal norms. So that's this little semicolon right there. <laughs> okay, so you can either take the categories, the attributes, and the norms as given, and just choose actions, right? Or you could possibly think about, in the law, this is like the short run, in the longer run, you can change your category, you can maybe change how you look, and people can even try and change what the norms are. Okay, so now I, this will only take five minutes, and then we'll take a, a well deserved break. Um, let's suppose we have a large population of individuals with some characteristic E star. There's two actions, action one and action two. Let's think of action one as effort in school. The economic payoffs are action one yield some value vi, depending on how skilled person i is, and action two yields zero. And anyone who does one, action one, pays some amount k if he meets someone who does two. And this is a negative externality. So this is like somebody acts up in school. So you're in a class, I'm working hard, somebody else doesn't work hard, they disrupt the classroom, it affects me. Okay. So this is all economic utility at this point, right? Standard kind of peer effect model. Here's a net, you know, the guy who doesn't act well in school affects me. It's a negative externality. Okay, good. Now let's add the identity ingredients. We have two categories, green and red. The norms are that greens should take action one and red should take action two. The green ideal is some EG. This is how, like, you want to think about this, that how somebody looks. So the green ideal here um, is not equal to the characteristic that this particular group has. Okay, so there's this other green group out there that actually has this, right? Has this characteristic, 
but the people in my population that I'm worried about don't have this characteristic. So you can think about this as blacks and whites. We just call them greens and reds to make it more general, but it's silly. So this is a kind of social exclusion, right? The people who are green should look a particular way, and if you don't look that particular way, you know you're not really going to fit in as being green. So it's a so sort of social exclusion. Then we have these identity utilities. An individual I loses some amount R if he adopts the green identity. He does not fit in. He's trying to fit in, but he doesn't really fit. Right? So he loses R. He's kind of rejected. Right? It's, he doesn't fit this ideal. Uh, somebody who is, decides to be an R, however, loses some amount if he does one because he does not abide for the norms for an R. So this is, the, this is an explicit acting white phenomenon, right? Somebody who is R, but then does something against the norms for an R, loses something personal about themselves. They don't feel good about what they've done. A G loses an IG zero. This is an externality. This is like a punishment because R does not accept G's choice, right? So that we've got a little bit of a conflict within this community here, this our large population of individuals. The G's don't like what the R's are doing, the R's don't like what the G's are doing, right? This, this is all these conversations you see in the, in the press about people being Uncle Toms, and so on and so forth. So if you're people in this population, some decide to be green and some decide to be red, the greens don't like what the red's choice and the reds don't like the green's choice, okay? And so they, there's this loss here, right? They interact with one another, okay? And so that's the opposite, right? The greens don't like the reds, the reds don't like the greens. Okay? So again, what you want to think about is you have some dominant group out there which is not modeled, but they influence what's going on here because to be green, you have to be, have this EG, right? But people in this group don't. Okay, is everybody clear? So now the question is, um, what's going to happen? So imagine there's some random matching. So individuals earn payoffs given their own identity and action and those of who they meet. And in the equilibrium, each individual is maximizing their payoffs given the choices of others in the population. So there's four options. A person could be a G1, right? Be green and do one, be green and do two, be R and do one, be R and do two. Got it? Four different possibilities. And to make our lives easier, we're going to get rid of G1, G2 ever being valuable. OK, so we just add some notation. G is the proportion of the population that adopts G1. P is the proportion of R's that adopt 1. So 1 minus G times P is the proportion of the population that does R1. 1 minus G, 1 minus P is the pro proportion of the population that adopts R2. Okay. So now what I want to look at is an equilibrium where people in this population are choosing their identity and choosing their action but given the social interactions within this group. And the social interactions are determined by this disagreement, right? A G doesn't like a red's choice, a red doesn't like a G's choice, and then there's a social exclusion that's going on as well, right? Somebody chooses to be a green, they don't really fit in. So you just look at the payoffs for each option. So this is what a, v or a, a, a G1 earns here, it's VI. He doesn't feel good about it, right? He suffers when he meets the non-green people, and he suffers from the people who are not green and who disrupt class, on top of it all. Right? Everybody OK? R1, the R1, he works, but oh boy, he's suffering because he's doing something which is really against the red norms. Um, he's suffering, too, because the green people say, you've made the wrong choice, and then he has to deal with the people who are disrupting class. And the R2, right, they don't work, right, but they have to deal with the greens. Okay. And so what you want to do is we're looking for equilibrium G's and equilibrium P's. So G's, where's the P and the P's? We're looking for equilibrium G's and P's. So there's many possible equilibria, as you can imagine here, and they're going to depend on the values of these parameters, of these identity parameters. For example, there could be an equilibrium where all greens are, uh, everyone's green. There could be some red some green, and various values of P. And what we want to look for is conditions under which these different equilibria emerge. So for example, all green is an equilibrium if and only if R is sufficiently small. Right? That's the only way you're going to get all of these people in this population becoming all green. You have to make R small. Right? 
So social exclusion is less than the punishment for adopting a red identity. And you can get a split where you have the population being um, green and one and R and two, if and only if R is in the intermediate range. So this is, I think, the equilibrium we're kind of in now, right? We have some, say, in the black population that's adopting this green identity and working, and we have the red population, right, which is adopting two. And if social exclusion is sufficiently high, then you only have a red equilibrium. So in the interest of time, I won't draw the picture. Does everyone get the, how this works? Okay. So I'll finish up. Oh, that was it. <laughs> there was a question, I think. No? Yeah. The question about maybe is goes to the next section, which is I'm thinking about kind of the relationship between identity and say social capital, um, uh -huh. and whether or not in this sort of situation would social capital just enter in as another part of a payoff, or is that something distinct? Is it distinct from identity, or is it a component? Because when I read the the Nobu Kuro article, it seemed like social capital was part of their identity definition, but. Boy, you know, uh, social capital is one of these words that I don't quite know what to do with. Which Ben Abu and Tirol article were, re were you referring I think to? The one, that the one on taboos? Yeah. Yeah, so um, let, me, let me give you a basic rundown about the difference between the Ben Abu and Tirol approach to identity and what George and I are doing. So, what George and I are doing is more of a social identity from social psychology approach. So, people are understanding themselves as parts, as, as, as as part of a group, and there are norms which then give me my preferences uh, about which group I'm um, sorry about, you know, what is appropriate and inappropriate behavior, and then social interaction, for example, could, could determine the equilibrium behavior. Okay, so that's what George and I are up to. What Roland, Benabou, and Jean Tirole are up to is more of a cognitive psychology. Okay. okay? So there, people don't have, they have a sort of a, a, they're trying to understand themselves, and through their actions, they form their identities, and then they try and understand who they are from what they do. Okay, so it's more of a cognitive psychological approach, whereas ours is more of a social psychological approach. So again, what, what let, me, let me just flip back to this really quick. Okay, this is the basic point. This is this model up here. Uh, you know, sometimes I hesitate to call it a model. What I think I'd rather call it is a new as a new conception of motivation. This is what's important about the identity approach: is that you, when you look at an, an economic environment, when you look at an economic situation, you have to do all of the economics you normally do. You should absolutely do all the economics you normally do. But then you also have to think: who are these people? What group do they belong to? What are the norms that govern? their behavior. How do they think about what they do? Is it appropriate or inappropriate for them to act in certain ways? And those are the identity ingredients. And when you put the identity ingredients together with the economic ingredients, you may get these trade-offs. And then through the interaction, you can get equilibrium patterns. So um, why don't we take a break? And we'll resume at 4. Is that good? OK, thanks very much for your attention.